It's the voice of the Cougars. Greg Rebell joins us in Studio B as we now look back on a very up-and-down, interesting, injury-riddled BYU basketball season that ultimately ended still with 24 wins, Greg. Let's start with the last game last night. Uh, and you told us earlier this week, Washington State's really good. They're like San Francisco. Remind you a lot of them. And ultimately, that was too much for the Cougars to handle. What are your thoughts on the loss last night? And ultimately, what was the undoing of BYU against the other Cougars? Well, let's talk about the last three games, the NIT games. They faced a regular season conference champ in the first game, a regular season conference champ in the second game, and a top five Pac-12 team that is now healthy and playing its best basketball of the year. Washington State has a better Ken Palm ranking than three Sweet 16 teams right now. (laughs) Okay? So better than Iowa State, better than Miami, and better than St. Peter's, but St. Peter's is a Cinderella. We don't, they, they, you know, you don't really want to compare. But the two that are kind of in their mix, they're ahead of Miami and Iowa State. They're one spot behind Providence, another Sweet 16 team. This was a good and is a good Washington State team playing its best basketball because they are healthy. And, and I thought that last night's game is fascinating in that it's kind of a microcosm of the objectives BYU wants to achieve in transitioning to the Big 12. You know, what does the Big 12 have? Length, physicality. What did Washington State have last night? Length, physicality, 6'10", 6'11", 6'10", off the bench. All right. Uh, Aggressive downhill guards, check, check. Washington State had that uh, going. Uh, Depth, Washington State, Kyle Smith didn't like what he saw early. From, he went to the bench early last night and got responses from those bench players. So their top eight players, five starters, three bench, their three bench guys gave them 10 field goals. BYU's top three, BYU's three bench guys gave them zero field goals. The depth was a factor last night. Uh, Washington State had it, and BYU didn't last night. So, you know, those are kind of three, you know, factors that BYU will want to address and objectives they want to achieve transitioning to the Big 12, want to get longer. And BYU was a longer team at the start of the year. Let's not forget, they lost two size, two, two pretty important pieces of the puzzle with length. You want to get longer, want to get deeper. You, you want to get that aggressive downhill guard play. Um, and, and we saw that last night from from WSU and uh, yeah they were going to be good and they were good it was interesting about last night guys is that BYU kind of neutralized Washington State inside in some ways the ways were uh, you know inside scoring was was dead even uh, between the two teams second chance points even uh, free throw attempts even offensive rebounds even rebounds even now, the, what, what doesn't show up there is the impact Washington State's length had inside, especially when it comes to rim protection and not letting BYU guards get downhill and finish at the rim. So there were some definite impacts by the WSU length, but in one way, BYU, or in many ways, BYU kind of neutralized it and played them to a standoff. Credit to Foos, credit to Caleb Lohner. BYU did enough good things inside. It really kind of came down to uh, both teams starting guard combos. BYU was outscored in the starting guard combos by 20, and they lost by 19. Mm. Uh, Those two guards for WSU made uh, eight threes, and BYU starting guard combo made uh, one three, I think. They made eight or nine, BYU made one. There's kind of the difference in the game last night. It actually came down to three-point shooting. Uh, BYU made 16 threes against Northern Iowa and only three against WSU. Now, you're going to get different looks against WSU. UNI gives you a lot of three looks. There weren't as many there against Washington State. But early, there were some good looks that BYU just wasn't hitting. It might have made a change in the game. And there was some bad luck and bad, you know, some bad bounce type things when it was still a game. I think about that five-point possession in the first half when BYU had a six-point lead. It kind of changed the tone of the game at that point. You know, what, what, what could have been a, a travel and a turnover turned into a good basket with a three-point play chance miss of the free throw loose ball foul on the free throw miss three-pointer off the inbounds boom a five-point swing part of a seven nothing run BYU went from up six to down one pretty quickly that was kind of a weird thing that happened that kind of changed the early tone in a 19-point game you can't nitpick too much but when it was still a game I think about that I kind of rambling bottom line is BYU played a good Washington State team that kind of showcased some things BYU will want to address and need to uh, to transition into the Big 12. Let's talk about Alex Barcelo. Obviously, his BYU career came to an end last night. How would you describe his season, his career, and what he's meant to this program? Well, gosh, uh, Coach Mark Pope on the postgame show last night uh, kind of reiterated, you know, the impact uh, that will be felt, you know, kind of in the community and in Cougar Nation and as a leader off the floor uh, will have been as important as anything he did on the floor. And, and again, I think, I think one of the greatest credits you can give the guy is that he was a, a three-year player that felt like a four- or five-year guy. 
here at BYU. He kind of felt like he had that kind of impact, and um, I, I just you know will will miss him so much. What a what a what a strong leader, and 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 so much was on his shoulders uh, after you know Jake and 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 TJ and Yoli left the program. He kind of had to carry this program in a lot of ways uh, for the last couple of seasons, and. You know, I, I think, you know, by the end of it, meaning the end of last night, I don't know how much was left in the tank for A.B. He just gave it all every game, started every game uh, that, he, that he played for, uh, for, for Coach Mark Pope, just answered the bell every night and took so much punishment, was so much the focal point uh, of every team's scout, so much attention, uh, physically and otherwise. The challenge for him just had to be enormous every night. And I think he just gave it his all, and by the end of it all, I don't know how many more made shots were left in him as a college player. He just put it all out there. And I just think he exhausted himself uh, as a leader for this program. Greg Rubel, the voice of the Cougars, is on BYU Sports Station. How will you remember the entirety of this season? Or in a way, define what we just witnessed over 35 games? Yeah, I mean, they played 35 and 124. And, and with the injuries early and the injuries late and using 10 different starting lineups, uh, and and yet, you know, beating tournament teams, BYU beat and well played and beat a lot of very good teams. Uh, very few teams challenged themselves out of league like BYU did this year. That was one of their strong, you know, one of the strong suits on their resume this year was what they want, what they did out of league that the committee asks you to do out of league. You know, and there, there were some things in which BYU fell short in conference play, but out of league, they, they did so much of what you want to do. And when you win 24 of 35 and use 10 different starting lineups to do it and lose your inside plan from the get-go, uh, you know, absolutely credit and kudos and plaudits uh, to get BYU to where it got, you know, one win away from getting to the NIT Final Four. And when you get to the NIT, look at the teams BYU played and the teams that are in the tournament now. That's a good field. BYU played good teams early, played good teams late, and 24 wins, I think, are, are to be applauded. I do wonder sometimes if the final 46 seconds at Santa Clara had played oh, out differently, yep. would the end of the season have played out differently? You know, that was such a, such a weird and key moment of the season where that weekend kind of became a lost weekend for BYU. And then the two losses that followed it, that you might actually, you know, those aren't bad losses on the back end, the USF home and Gonzaga home. Those happen. But that weekend prior, if that had just turned out, and even maybe just that last minute turned out differently, might have things turned out differently in the end, we'll never know. But um, it was such a strange thing to occur to a program that had never lost back-to-back regular season games under Coach Pope to suddenly losing four in a row that kind of took BYU off balance, you know, kind of staggered them. But, you know, they got off the mat, right? And and what they did late put themselves back in a position to be on the bubble and keep themselves into the mix uh, to the very end. It is such a hard tournament to make. It is such a hard tournament to qualify for. And yet, BYU's always right there. You know, dip years are few and far between. And, and when your quote-unquote, you know, dip year is, you know, you know, 20 plus wins and playing in the NIT, <laughs> you're a pretty dang good program. And, and it really can't, you know, it's, it wasn't even that much of a dip. You know, it was just a weird spot in the season where they had a bit of a rut, climbed out of it, just not all the way. As we see sometimes through adversity, there can be positive things that come out of it. And obviously the adversity is losing your bigs early in the season. The positive thing came out of it is we discovered how good Foos is. What type of role do you want to see for him next year, knowing that they're going to add some size around him? Yeah, if he can just more and just add additional components to his game, uh, the next thing might be, you know, facing and, 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 and putting it on the floor a little bit. Um, you know, Yoli Childs is a great comp. You know, he was in the, he was in the building last night. He saw Foose break his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his freshman rebounding record. Uh, and and, and what, what a great comp to have and to have others use as an illustration uh, to have that kind of impact is, is maybe reasonable to expect right now. Uh, and, and yet, you know, he, he is such a wide body and yet so smooth and kind of silky in the way he moves. Uh, I couldn't be more excited than to watch his development as a foundational piece for BYU into the Big 12. You know, you talk about, well, who on the roster looks like a quote-unquote Big 12 guy? That's a Big 12 guy. All right, Foose is a Big 12 guy, and, and they've got him early, and, and so much was shown as a true freshman, and he was dropped into the deep end yes. after that UVU game, essentially, yeah. right? You know, the, the progression might have been a little more slow and gradual and yet similarly encouraging, but um, it was it was the baptism by fire, and he came through it with flying colors, and uh, how exciting uh, to have him as, again, a foundational piece for this program moving forward. Greg Rubel on BYU Sports Nation. As we push forward to next year and look at what Mark Pope is dealing with 
uh, in terms of compiling a roster. We've talked about BYU's need to add some size, like some guys or a, mm-hmm. at least one guy over the you know, height of six feet, eight inches, six, nine. And then they clearly need uh, a point guard. Got to find a point, yeah. Lucas right. and Alex Barcelo. So what do you expect the roster turnover to be like, and, and where does Mark Pope go from here? Well, where Mark Pope always goes, which is everywhere. Uh, it, that's the one great thing about uh, – the one fun thing about watching him coach and, and, and create uh, rosters year to year is where he goes and how he finds and what he brings in, and the portal changes everything for everyone. But, you know, Mark Pope is already on the job. Like, he is finding next year's team now. Um, it's happening immediately. And, and uh, you know, I, I think coaches want to play for him for a lot of good reasons. Uh, the fact that you can put almost, you know, 12,000 fans in the building uh, for an NIT quarterfinal is one of them. Uh, there are a lot of things BYU has going for it right now. Love the staff. Uh, you know, we always want the staff to progress, meaning guys get better jobs. But selfishly, I want this group to stay together for a while because I just love how they work together uh, under Coach Pope. And, and, yes, we want all those guys to get their chances. They've earned them. They deserve them. But, man, it's, it's a great group. And I'd love to see them you know, stay together as long as they're happy to be together. Uh, I, I'd love that to happen. But that's, that's the, the, the neat thing is he can go and kind of create a new look um, uh, for next season and beyond. But I think BYU – and this is just me thinking, but um, – you're probably looking to buy more than rent right now. Uh, I, I don't know that, that one-year guys help you a ton. Uh, a great, you still want to win a WCC championship, and, and, and a push toward that would be great. But I think you're looking more for you know guys with a little more longevity, the two- and three-year, if not the true freshman who can be with you four or five. But I, I, don't, I don't know that one-year guys are going to help a ton or as much as maybe they might have otherwise, whereas more two- and three-year guys that can be, again, foundational pieces for that transition into the Big 12. I don't know if Mark Pope's thinking this way, but maybe when he goes goes out and he looks at guys he's thinking well this is a a guy that in two years I can be leaning on to help us win games in a very very tough league they're going into I wish we weren't doing it today and recapping BYU's basketball season but this is the reality that we are dealing with and uh, as I told you Greg you're the perfect man to help us kind of process through everything that happened over those 35 games. Well, we've all had a good look one way or the other at what transpired over these last <laughs> 35 games, and I think we can all appreciate all the hard work that went into getting 24 wins. Certainly. And uh, and, and man alive. Uh, I, I love the atmosphere last night. Uh, it, it's invigorating that you can, uh, you know, have disappointment uh, you know, for a short span, be kind of erased by the, uh, the the excitement that comes with a new tournament run and a new feel and a new vibe. And uh, and getting to the quarterfinals is an achievement, and I think it should be applauded. And we know that uh, the objectives will always be to get to the NCAA yep. tournament, which BYU does more often than not over the last quarter century, right? And, and so, uh, you know, onward with that pursuit. And pursuit of a WCC championship, too. One last crack. One, one, one more, more last chance. Crack at trying to contend for that league title next year. And then uh, during this next year, you know, you're already going to be, you know, kind of one foot in one league and one foot in the next because all those things are going to start coming out in terms of, uh, you know, schedules being released and broadcast plans and all the things that go into the transition. And that'll be exciting, too. Yes, it is exciting. Greg, thanks for the time. Always a pleasure.